Well, we're looking forward to this last session, I guess you can say, of our GROW conference, and we're privileged to have Dr. Crawford Loritz with us today. So uh, I'm going to welcome you up, brother, and uh, may the Lord be with you at this time. What a joy it is to be here with you. I've actually fallen in love with your pastor and his family and the hospitality, and then there's so many kind, wonderful things were said and shared yesterday, and I just want to thank you for the privilege of being here. I bring you greetings from my wife. Uh, you know, I retired as a senior pastor fellowship on uh, Easter Sunday was my last Sunday, and, and my wife has been traveling with me uh, a lot. Uh, uh, one of the reasons probably she's not with me now, we were just on a 12, 13 day trip, and so she said, buddy, you're on your own on this one, so she said, has to be back home, but I do, do uh, bring greetings from her. Uh, she is the absolute joy of my life. I shared with the people yesterday that we celebrated our 50th anniversary this year, and uh, and of course, I mean, you say, well, you don't look that old. Well, yeah, I do. So, but uh, she, she is just, uh, just amazing, just uh, a gift from God to me. Well, we've got a long ways to go and a short time to get there. So if you have a Bible, uh, a device, or a great memory, uh, turn with me to 1 Kings, back in the Old Testament, 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter, chapter 2, 1 Kings chapter 2. And just leave your Bible open there for a while. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. You have been so good to us, so good to us. Forgive us for those seasons of uh, unbridled entitlement in which we complain and criticize and we, woe is me. Uh, but when we sit back and think about how far you have bought us, what you've done in our hearts and lives, the grace that you've given to us, we say thank you. And so, Lord God, I pray that you'll speak to our hearts today. I'm acutely aware of the fact that uh, nobody needs to hear my miscellaneous ramblings about anything. Uh, nobody needs to hear my thoughts or opinions about anything. But, God, we need a word from you. And I pray that you'll make your word clear. You have spoken, Father. May we be listening. And I also pray that you push back all of the distractions, uh, uh, our wandering thoughts, uh, our heads sometimes can be where our bodies are not, and I pray that you'll uh, cause us not to mention anything that you want to say to each one of us today. Lord Jesus, we pray that we will encounter your truth and respond to what you have to say. Thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was asked to speak here, uh, I pray about what I speak on because preaching is not speech-making. Um, you know, preaching as a word from God for the people at a moment in history, and God has spoken, and your life is too valuable for me to come up and just sort of mail it in and give you a speech. And I just felt strongly led, particularly today, uh, to talk about, I've entitled the message, Footprints in the Sand. Um, one of the great tragedies about life is that we tend to get very myopic meaning that we detach ourselves from what went on before us and what will come on after us. And as the old saying goes, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn anything at all from history, and so we end up doing some of the same dumb things that other people did before and will do after us. And we waste the equity of the moment. We, let, we waste the, 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 the lessons. We waste what has been placed into our hands. And for not to get too heavy theologically, but from a theological perspective, the existence of any group of people at any given moment in history has to do with the stewardship of God throughout all of human history. What do you mean by that? Well, our primary purpose is to pass on the image of God from one generation to the next and to steward his purposes from one generation to the next. That's the purpose of human history. So in a very real sense, it's not just about my moment in history. My life is, is not just about my business. In a very real sense, even though people say this all the time, well, I don't, I don't want to leave any legacy or this kind of thing. I'm just trying to survive and make it, and so I'm not into leaving a legacy. Well, forgive my directness here, but that's categorically ridiculous. If you're living and breathing, whether or not you want to leave a legacy, that's not even on the table. You will leave a legacy. So the question is not whether or not you want to. The question is, what kind will you leave? And so you can't get away from a statement that you're going to make with your life. None of us can get away with that. 
There's no such thing as a private life in that regard, ultimately. Every choice, every decision, we're sending to a time that we cannot see. And every choice and decision is making a statement about the stewardship, whether we value it or we devalue it, that's been given to us. And life is valuable. And life is about the expression of God during our moment in history. One of the most moving experiences I had was, it happened a number of years ago, and I was ambushed by this. i never forget, I was traveling, and I was in Dallas, Texas, I was speaking at an event, and got there, and the same, it was the same day in which uh, there was a tape-delayed uh, service of the legendary entertainer Sammy Davis Jr. And I, I turned on the TV while I was unpacking my bags there in the hotel, and I, as I watched it, I, I was riveted. Um, they had these tributes to the legendary entertainer. Uh, all these people were giving these tributes, but the, the one that captured me was a tribute that Gregory Hines gave to Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, Hines has since passed away himself. But I, I had not known this. Hines talked about how Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, was like a father figure to him in a very real sense. He talked about how he and his brother, when they were little guys, they would sneak in the Apollo Theater there in Harlem and watch Sammy Davis Jr. and his uncles perform. He shared about how Sammy Davis Jr. opened doors for him, got him gigs, and, and, and how he, uh, uh, Sammy Davis was legendary in his generosity and how he even gave him money to help bridge those down times. Fast forward. Sammy Davis Jr. was dying of throat cancer. And uh, so Hines said he, he knew he only had a few weeks to live, so he flew out to L.A. to see uh, his mentor. And as he walked into the house, he saw Sammy Davis Jr. sitting on the couch, and it just really destroyed him. He said his body was totally emaciated. Uh, Sammy Davis was always a slight man, but he said it's just, he had just withered to just about nothing. So Hines said he sat down next to him and gave him a tribute told him how much he meant to him and um, uh, the impact that he had on his life. He was tearful. He thanked him for all that he had done for him. He was procrastinating leaving because he realized that this was it. And at this point, uh, the cancer had just ravaged his throat. He could not sp speak anymore. So um, Heinz said he leaned over tearfully and kissed it, Sammy Davis Jr. on his cheek. And he said he got up to walk away. He went to walk toward the front door. But as he was walking toward the front door, he, he hears this shuffling behind him. And he turns around to his utter amazement, barely able to stand up, is Sammy Davis Jr. And he goes like this. I don't care if you're four or five years old or you're 100 years old. You will do this to succeeding generation. What's in your hands? That's the reason why you have to live life with great intentionality. Life is but a brief moment in history lodged between two vast eternities. Every single day of your life, you've got to decide what you're going to do with your moment. Someone once said, if you want to leave footprints in the sands of time, you got to wear work boots, meaning that you have to be intentional about your life. you you got to carry some weight about you. So what, what's, what's, in, what's in your hands? Here in 1 Kings chapter 2, I, I, I love studying the great handoffs in the Bible. I love studying them. And if you've ever talked to people who are elderly people, those folks who have followed Christ for a long time and they're facing death, it's amazing how essence they are. They, they, don't, they don't talk about a lot of fluff. You hear them talking about the noble things of life, those things that are always, always, always true. They talk about the things that are transgenerational. They talk about the stuff that are not fads. They talk about the things that are sustainable. And in this text, David is dying. He's dying. He's calling his son in, Solomon, who's next. 
And David doesn't beat around the bush. There's not a lot of, a lot of verbal scud missiles here, verbal fillers here. It, there's not a lot of wandering thoughts in these four verses. No, David gets to the bottom line. And he charges Solomon, listen to this, he charges Solomon to make three fundamental decisions that will determine the outcome of his reign as king of Israel. Three decisions, three decisions. Old boy said, uh, never forget this, old boy said some time ago, he said, uh, uh, when you're born, you look like your parents, but when you die, you look like your decisions. And I tell young people this all the time. I, you know, you, you can blame your parents and you can blame uh, your background and you can blame their bad decisions for your choices and decisions for a little while. But after a certain point, you start getting into your early 20s and stuff, this is a tipping point. The issue with your life is not what has been done to you. The issue with your life is what are you deciding to do from this point forward. Because your decisions, how you respond, the choices that you make, you own them for good or bad. And the legacy of your life is predicated on the choices and decisions that you make. It's as simple as that. Now, there are contributing factors, don't get me wrong, and there's pain and abuse and all, I'm not minimizing that, but, but you've got you've to own it. So David calls Solomon in. Now, let's read these words, because he, he actually challenges Solomon to make these three fundamental decisions, and I don't have anything really complicated to say. The text is straightforward with these three decisions. And the three decisions, I'll give them to you, and then we'll walk through the passage. The three decisions that David says to Solomon that he's going to have to make. He's going to have to, number one, decide, decide to live courageously. Number two, he's going to have to decide, decide to live obediently. Number three, he's going to have to decide, decide to live faithfully. These are decisions. And it's as if David said, I can't make these decisions for you. I, ca I can't make them for you. Yeah, you got a great heritage, you got great shoulders to stand on, you've got some things back here, there's a lot of history and all this stuff, but I can't decide for you. I can't decide for you. And by the way, parenthetically, we have four adult children, thank the Lord, they're walking with God, our two sons are pastors here. But I got to tell you, we've had some hard conversations. In their teen years, when they were, were making choices and decisions, and you know, they were you know, all this other stuff. I remember having these come to Jesus conversations with them. I, I had told Brian, Brendan, and Heather, and Holly, I can't walk with God for you. I can't do it. I can't read the scriptures for you. I can't overcome the sin in your life for you. I can't make those decisions. Buddy, you own them. And this is what David is saying to his son. Now, the text begins here in verse 1. It says, when David's time to die drew near, he commanded, his, he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am about to go the way of all the earth. Pause here for a moment. Yeah. Sometimes when we read our Bibles, we fail to, and I said this yesterday, appreciate, appreciate the historical drama in the emotional drama that's taking place here. Think about who's dying. At this point, David is not, not, not some little shepherd boy. He's not running from Saul anymore. At this juncture in his life, he is a living legend. David is the most powerful and revered king in the then known world. Solomon's coming in. He sends for Solomon, and probably David is extraordinarily weak. He's dying. His voice is not strong. I wish I was a fly on the wall in that bedroom. He says, Solomon, I'm about to go the way of all flesh. And although his voice is weak, his message is extraordinarily strong. 
And the very first thing he says to his son Solomon, realizing that Solomon is met next, he says, Solomon, you need to decide, son. You need to decide to live courageously. He says to him in verse 2, be strong and show yourself a man. Wow. There is a truckload of stuff behind what David is saying to Solomon. And I don't want to be guilty of reading too much into the text here. But I think in this, in this one line, uh, David is acknowledging to Solomon, and Solomon has is, is got to understand what his daddy is acknowledging to him. The first thing that I think what David is saying to Solomon is that, Solomon, listen, you're going to have to be what the position requires. You're going to have to become that. You're going to have to become that. Uh, you, I can't coattail that in for you, okay? You're going to have to be what the position requires. And this is courage. I talked about this yesterday. But all of us, as we face life, we have to be what our moment in history requires. There comes a point in time you have to just stop, you have to stop running. You just have to stop running. You have to stop deflecting. You have to be what your moment in history requires. And this is exactly what he's saying to him. And I, know, I know I'm sounding like a locker room coach here, but David is saying to his son, hey, hey, you, uh, you're going to be king. You're going to be king. you got to be what this position requires. The other thing that I think that David is saying to his, to his son here is that, look, he's acknowledging that David and Solomon were completely different. They're completely different. Da David, <laughs> David knew that his boy grew up with a lot of cotton around him, a lot of cushion. Uh, he, he didn't, Solomon wasn't running and hiding out in caves. David, you know, don't get it twisted about David. David is, is one, of my, one of my favorite characters in the Bible because of the confliction and paradoxes that are in his life. On one hand, he is, he is very artistic, poetic, in touch with his feelings, a musician. Don't get that twisted. On the other hand, David was a tough dude. In fact, God said to David, David wanted to build a temple, and God goes, ah, let's make that order of new business for your son. Because David, you shed too much blood. David was a street fighter. David hid out, and he ran from Saul for 16 years, hid out in caves. Saul couldn't touch him. He was a survivor. David knew how to handle his enemies and those who had power struggles. And he's probably looking at Solomon and saying, Solomon, there's some dudes in my administration. I can handle them because of the strength of my personality, but yeah, I don't know that you can handle them. You have to show yourself a man. Not everybody who's close to you is your friend, my brother. So he said, Solomon, show yourself a man. Solomon, when he grew up, so he, you know, there was a lot of, David was an extraordinarily wealthy man by the same time Solomon comes around. Solomon had servants all around him. He had bling bling, he had the stuff, he had all of this stuff. And so David is warning him, he says, Solomon, don't, don't, don't mistake recognition with toughness. Just because you got visibility and recognition doesn't necessarily mean that you have under the hood what's necessary to do the job. You need to show yourself a man. We'll all be challenged in life. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the things that, that as a pastor I've seen this, um, I've seen pa parents coddle their children too much and cushion them too much and bail them out too much and they're ill-equipped for the stress, struggle, and strain of life. Just because you can doesn't mean that you should. And I think as we disciple people, understand that protection is not development. It may be part of it, but also sometimes... Sometimes part of development is standing back and letting those who you love take a hit. And so he was saying, Solomon, <laughs> you're going to have to learn how to take a punch, son. 
show yourself a man. You'd have to decide that, though. Right now, Solomon, before they lower me in the ground, buddy, you're going to have to decide. Decide to live courageously. The second decision that he drives at Solomon, <laughs> he says in so many words, now Solomon, you need to understand something. You can't live any old kind of way you want to live and expect the blessing of God to fall on you, okay? You do know that. Listen to what he says here. Number two, you need to decide to live obediently. Verse three says, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, walking in his ways and keeping his statutes, his commandments, his rules, and his testimonies, as is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Solomon, listen to me. Listen to me. You, you, you don't get a pass because I'm your dad. You understand that? You're not, you don't get a pass. just because you're related to me. You don't get a pass. You, you're going to have to make a decision, Solomon. The blessing and favor of God will be with you because you pursue a heart of obedience. And just because you're David's son does not mean that God somehow is going to wink and nod at your disobedience. And I also think that there's a little bit of an, of an ellipsis here. I think that Although it was not stated, I think both David and Solomon heard loudly what was not being said. What do you mean by that, Crawford? I, I, I actually think that David is saying this stuff, but he's also, also saying to Solomon, now, you do know what happened between me and your mama, right? You know that, don't you? You, you do know that. You, 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 do, you, do know, you, you do know that uh, I had your mama's father killed, right? You know that. You do know I committed adultery with your mother, right? It's public knowledge. Everybody knows that. You, you do know that Nathan came to me. And by the way, I tried to manage to sit and hide it for quite a while. And Nathan confronted me. You do know, Solomon, right? You had three brothers who died prematurely because of my sin, right? You know that, don't you? you? You also know, you also know that the latter part of my reign was riddled with chaos. Family chaos, mess. Your brother Absalom came after me to kill me. You do know that, right? And I think what he's saying to Solomon is that, hey, look, man, don't get stupid and don't get foolish. You can choose your sin, but you can't choose your consequences. And he's saying in so many words, God forgave me, and you know that. He put me back to where, where, where I am today. Thank God for that. But there's a price to be paid when you willfully disobey. And I, and I, and I, I just, I just need, need for us to grab a hold of this. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap, and there ain't no such thing as crop failure with God. None. And I think one of the realities that we have to disciple and help people with is that grace does not mean permission. Grace does not mean permission. Grace does not mean you're permitted to do whatever you want to do. Because you're going to pay for that. And nobody gets away with anything. And so you want the favor of God on your life, and yet you want to cultivate a hidden life. Oh, I would to God that Solomon remember this, you know, because this is the big one that he forgot, right? And it ended up a mess. I remember uh, I just saw early this morning my oldest son posted something uh, on Facebook, he dropped off, uh, uh, we've got 11 grandkids, he dropped off one of our grandsons, his middle boy at college. And uh, I just had this flashback as I, as I read this. He talked about how it was tearful to see, and this is the second one that he's dropped off at college. And Miles is a, is a great kid. He is uh, just, just a terrific, 
he's at uh, he's going to Biola University in, South, in Southern California. So Brian posted how how he felt, and I had a flashback when I dropped Brian off at the college, you know. And I I, I sort of was ambushed by emotion. He went to Brian went to Cairn University down here. I it was Philadelphia College, by, but I dropped him off. We drove up from Georgia and. Um, and I was surprised. I was, su I was surprised by the emotion that 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 hit me. You know, we've raised our kids to be fairly independent, and Brian had traveled and been to, you know, missions trips, and he'd been with me out of the country and all this stuff. So, uh, I was kind of surprised. Uh, we got on campus, got him checked in his room, and you know, we went out to eat, and we just walked around a little bit. And I found myself procrastinating leaving, and. Uh, so I asked him, Dad, you want, you want to get something else to eat? And he said, Dad, we just ate. You're going to look like Shamu the whale, man. So, you know, so, we just, uh, so we get to the parking lot, and uh, I just uh, hugged him and kissed him on his cheek and prayed with him. And I said, son, I, I don't have any more sermons. I preached to you all the way up here from Georgia. So I have nothing else to say but just these two words. Two words. Obey And this is what Solomon was saying, and David was saying to his son. Son, the blessing and favor of God, attracting the blessing and favor of God ain't all that heavy. It's not all that hard to understand. But it will require you to say no to yourself. You're going to have to obey God. You cannot get around that. You can't get around it. Obey God. So David's dying. Solomon's in his room. The legendary prince of Israel is dying. So Solomon, you need to decide. You need to decide. Decide to live courageously. Solomon, you need to decide. I can't make this decision for you. You need to decide to live obediently. And then thirdly, he says, Solomon, you need to decide to live faithfully. Listen to these words here, verse 4, that the Lord may establish his word that he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons pay close attention to their way to walk before me in faithfulness with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Now, technically speaking, and, I, and, and I, I do get this, technically speaking, faithfulness is a subset of obedience, technically. But I wanted to parse it out just a little bit. What David is saying to his son is that, you know, uh, it's not just obedience in the macro big stuff. It's, it's doing the consistent next right thing, the consistent next thing right thing. When no one is looking, but cultivating a, a heart that does a consistent next right thing. On the words of Eugene Peterson, who defines faithfulness as a long obedience in the same direction. The next right thing. The next right thing. The next right thing. And when you make a mistake, you confess it. You make it right. And you keep stumbling toward the next right thing. The next right thing. David knew that, hey, hey, Solomon, the thing that's going to ambush you, the thing that's going to ambush you not be the big things. The thing that's going to ambush you is inconsistency in the small things. That's the stuff that, that slowly begins to erode your will to resist. That's why faithfulness is so important. Faithfulness is strength. Hear me on this. Hear me on this. I got a little mileage on me, okay? Listen to me. Listen to me. What I've learned in almost 50 years of ministry is simply this. A number of things I've learned, but one of the big things is this. Listen, listen. Said it yesterday, and I want to underscore today. I have learned that gifts, talents, and abilities have a terrible tendency to be overrated. They're it's overrated. They're overrated. You know how many gifted, talented people I have met in my life that's crashed and burned? 
You know how many of them have been on my teams of people that I've led that have crashed and burned. Younger guys that I have mentored who can preach the birds out the trees at great leadership ability, great insight, all of these kinds of things. But they began to operate from response. And their gifts and their talents and abilities took them to places where they got great visibility and great response. But the problem was that underneath the hood, they had ignored certain consistent habits and they were like a ship, a huge freighter ship that didn't have any, any water in the ballast hold of the ship. And the ship rides too high in the water. And when the storm comes, it flips over. So gifts, talents, and abilities have a tendency to be overrated. Faithfulness, has, however, has a, it, it's tragically, tragically underrated. You give, me, you give me somebody with C-minus abilities, but who is faithful. I'll take them over someone with A-plus gifts, talents, and abilities, but who is erratic. And the C-minus person will have fruit that will just eclipse that dude over time. Over time. It is cultivating what you do in private. It is the little stuff. It is the character stuff. And this is what David's trying to tell his son. Solomon. Solomon. God told me if my boys would be faithful, doing the next right thing, doing the next right thing. And by the way, parents, and I don't mean to you know, bust you on this, but listen, as parents, um, sometimes we wink and nod over that child who's extremely gifted and talented in certain areas of life, and we let him get by with little inconsistent stuff. He doesn't always tell the truth, or he doesn't always show up on time, and he doesn't follow the responsibility. But because he can do all of this, we kind of we get too impressed with our kids. As a pastor, I've seen that. I've seen it. Little Lord Fauntleroy can hit a ball, or he can shoot, or, or whatever, and so you, you, you give him a pass. But even that ability will be cratered later on because of lack of consistency in the little things. I was being interviewed um, a while back, and so this person said to me in, in the interview, uh, and, and I, I say this, I, I want to make a point by this. I'm not boasting about myself or anything like that. The person said to me in an interview, oh, I listen to your radio programs and read your book and this kind of, well, you're, you're pretty great. And then I stopped them. I said, no, I, I don't mean to be falsely humble here. But I think we need to, we need to understand the difference between greatness and recognition. I got a little recognition. But greatness is buried side by side in Old Dominion Cemetery. That's my mother and my father. Nobody knew anything about them. But my dad was a man of impeccable integrity that showed up every day, loved his wife, took care of his kids, kept pointing us to Jesus. He said, that's greatness. So don't confuse recognition with greatness. I uh, want to share this story with you before I close. My, my, um, my great-grandfather, his name is Peter. He's with the Lord. He was a slave. He said, great-grandfather? Don't you mean your great-great-grandfather? No, it's my great-grandfather. My dad was the youngest boy of 14 kids, and he was born February 13th, 1914. So it was his grandfather, Peter, who was a slave. And Peter lived to be an old man. He lived to be, my dad remembered him. Um, as a little boy, the, the old homestead there in Conover, North Carolina, in Catawba County there, um, Peter used to, as the family lore goes, he used to sit on the front porch and rock back and forth and sing and pray. Uh, loved the Lord Jesus. But he was illiterate. So check this out. He was illiterate, but he had memorized huge portions of the scripture. 
what, what he used to make his kids and grandkids do is read them favorite passages of the scripture over and over and over and over and over again. And the old boy had committed a lot of that to memory. Forged generations. My granddad, Milton, and my, my, my dad and my uncles and my aunts. I mean, it's just incredible impact. The man was a slave, but he loved the Lord Jesus. Fast forward. Um, a few years ago, my oldest son and I, Brian, we were speaking at the Billy Graham Center there in Asheville, North Carolina, at a conference together. And uh, Asheville is only about 45, 50 miles from the old homestead. And we hadn't been there in years. Brian hadn't been there since he was a little boy, and I hadn't been there in a number of years. So we had some time one afternoon. I said, Brian, you want to want to drive down to Conover and, and uh, uh, go to the old cemetery there? He said, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we hopped in the car and made our way there. I was sort of surprised myself because I remembered how to get, get there. And um, my grandfather had acquired a, uh, some, acres, uh, some land down there, and he'd given across from the old homestead, he'd given land for the church, a place called Thomas Chapel, Amy Zion Church, to build a church on. But there had always been a cemetery on that plot back over there. And in that cemetery, about a third to half of the people buried in that cemetery is related to us. So as we were walking through the cemetery, um, I began pointing out to Brian who some of these people were, and I said, they're your great-grandparents. This is Pop-Pops, my dad's parents, uh, uh, your great-grandfather Milton, your great-grandmother Anna over there, and there's your great-uncle Emery over there, and there's your great-uncle Wardell over there, and there's your great-aunt Anna over here. And, I, and as I was pointing out these people, I got ambushed by emotion. I began to weep. And I turned to my son and said, Brian, nobody knows who these people are. Nobody knows who these people are, but they were faithful people. They loved the Lord Jesus. And my son, God's given him a national platform. He's written a number of books, and God's done some wonderful things in my life too. But I said to him, Brian, all the stuff that God has been doing in our lives right here, you need to understand something. It's not about us. These people paid our tuition. They paid our tuition. They did this. And we have a holy obligation before God to be humble, grateful stewards of what these people labored in obscurity for and you stand on their shoulders. And people ask me all the time about the old stuff. I'm on boards of stuff and this kind of thing. But I can't tell you the number of times, the number of times, any number of times in which I'm tempted with pride or that kind of thing. My, the Lord just brings Peter back to mind. Saying about you, buddy. One of the things that's breaking my heart about this generation It's a lack of gratitude. The entitlement that has grabbed us. And this is what David was driving at with his son. Son, it's not about doing me proud. It's about what God has placed in your hands through me. What are you going to do with it? So, when you're born, you look like your parents. When you die, you look like your decision. What are you going to decide to do? Jesus is the brand new beginning for all of us. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. He has the ability to change histories, to forgive us of our sins, and to empower us to represent him during our moment in history. That's why he said, I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. So no matter where you came from, functional or dysfunctional, or some type of quasi in between, it is the, Jesus is the source to turn everything around and to keep us going in that direction. Father, thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for what you've done. 
Thank you, O God, for these models throughout history, throughout your word that scream at us, this is the way, walk in it. Lord, we pray in the name of your son that you'll help all of us to make the kinds of choices and decisions, Lord, that represent the glory of our great God, the hope of Calvary, the power of the gospel. And may the mark that we leave during our moment in history not be a tribute to ourselves, but a tribute to an empty tomb, a risen Savior, and the power and hope that Jesus Christ can give to all of us. In Jesus' name, amen.